Good morning, everyone. The Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. I welcome everyone to today's hearing on threats to reproductive rights in America. I will now recognize myself for my opening statement. More than 45 years ago, the United States Supreme Court recognized that women must have the right to control their own bodies, including by having the right to decide when to have children and when to terminate a pregnancy. That was not an unlimited right, but it was a right. More than 25 years ago, the Supreme Court affirmed that right after years of sustained opposition. Now in this year, the year of 2019, the rights of women across this nation are under attack like never before. It started with a flurry of laws meant to scare and shame women and to regulate abortion providers out of existence. These laws require clinics to offer or perform ultrasounds on women and even to provide medically inaccurate counseling, counseling dictated by the legislature, not by doctors. They demean women by imposing, quote, waiting periods, unquote, and some, such as my home state of Tennessee, compound the obstacles in red tape by requiring women to travel to a clinic to receive the state's mandated lecture written by our General Assembly about her body in person, then undergo a waiting period, and then travel back for the appointment. Other laws also enacted under the guise of protecting women have attempted to shut clinics down by requiring doctors to obtain admitting privileges at nearby hospitals and requiring the clinics to outfit themselves like surgical facilities. Ironically, because abortion is such a low-risk procedure, doctors are often unable to meet the requirements for admitting privileges because few or none of the, their patients ever require a hospital visit. In Alabama, as Dr. Yashika Robinson will note, the state passed legislation that required her clinic to relocate to a new facility so that it could meet burdensome new physical requirements. Then when the relocation was complete, the state passed a law to try to chase the clinic away again by prohibiting it from operating next to a nearby school. It was only through the intervention of a federal judge that the clinic was allowed to stay open. A few years ago, there was some hope that the Supreme Court's ruling in Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstein would put a stop to laws like these. In that case, the court struck down a Texas law that required doctors to provide providing abortions to obtain admitting privileges at hospitals and required providers to have the physical capacity of a full surgical facility. The Supreme Court, with Justice Kennedy joining the majority opinion, held that these requirements had no medical benefit for women and would serve only to close down clinics, leading to particularly harsh results for poor women and women in rural communities. But Justice Kennedy has now been replaced by Justice Kavanaugh, and it now seems the gloves are off. Many states have dropped the pretense altogether that they are somehow trying to protect women. This year alone, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Ohio have enacted laws banning abortion once a fetal heartbeat is detected, which occurs approximately six months into a pregnancy, before many women even know they are pregnant. Alabama has enacted a law banning abortion outright, with exceptions only in cases where the life of the mother is endangered. There are no exceptions for rape or incest or for women's health. Missouri has enacted a law banning abortions after eight weeks, and Arkansas and Utah have enacted laws banning abortions after 18 weeks, all periods in which Roe v. Wade protects a woman's right. Many other states have enacted the so-called trigger laws that would immediately ban abortion if the Supreme Court overturns its decision in Roe v. Wade. These states appear to be betting that the court is about to take that step. We cannot afford to go back. I would not presume to know what it's like for a woman to live in a world where she has to participate in a crime in order to end a pregnancy that she does not want or cannot afford to have or cannot put her body through or was the result of rape or incest. Americans, Democrats, and Republicans are in strong, strong support of allowing abortion when it is the result of rape or incest or to protect the life of a woman. And in most of these states' new laws, those exceptions are not written into the law, making it a very, very minor, unpopular, and undemocratic approach. I do remember what it was like for the women I knew growing up. I remember when a friend of my family needed to get an abortion when it was illegal in the United States, pre Roe v. Wade. She was relatively lucky, she was wealthy. So she was able to fly across the country to California and go to Tijuana. And it made me realize I was only 14 or 15 years old, what a poor person would be in the circumstance they'd be in. They'd be out of luck. 
because they couldn't afford that first class air ticket or the coach class air ticket. But air tickets were expensive in the 60s and to go cross country and go to Mexico was an expensive ordeal, which people of means could afford to do. People not of means could not. This had a disparate impact upon poor women, women of color, women in rural communities who couldn't take the time off or had the money to make that trip. If states are allowed to outlaw access to abortion again, these laws will doubtless have that disparate impact on these groups of women, just as it was when it was illegal before Roe v. Wade. Women are fighting back. Our witnesses today include two legal experts who are raising awareness of these issues, one of whom is fighting day after day to keep these clinics open. We'll also hear from two physicians who provide reproductive health care to patients, including abortion care when necessary. And we have two women with the courage to share their own stories about receiving abortions because they have recognized how important it is to destigmatize this subject and stop shaming women for their choices in medical histories. I thank our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to hearing from each of the women on the panel about this critical and timely subject. It is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this is a serious issue, and there may be no more divisive issue in our country than the decades-long battle over the sanctity of human life. Indeed, many Americans regard this as the defining issue of our times. In Congress, our pro-life caucus and Republican conference members work hard every day to advance measures to protect more children in the womb because they are the most vulnerable and threatened lives in our society. We do this work because we share the same deep and abiding conviction that so many of the founders of this extraordinary nation did about the sanctity of human life. It is that seminal conviction, of course, that is recorded in the very birth certificate of our nation, the Declaration of Independence, and has come to be known as our nation's creed. We know the language well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We believe, as the founders articulated, that every single human life is sacred because that value is given to us not by the state, but by our creator, in whose image all of us are made. Because of this, every single human life has inestimable dignity and value, and our value is not related in any way to the color of our skin, our zip code, or socioeconomic status, our level of talent or education, or what we can contribute to society. Our value is inherent because it is given to us by our Creator. During the first two centuries of our republic, most Americans accepted and revered the biblical truths that every human being is fearfully and wonderfully made and personally known by our Creator, God, even before they were formed in their mother's womb. The rejection of that essential truth has now led to the murder of more than 60 million innocent preborn children since 1973's Roe v. Wade. What an unspeakable tragedy this is. In addition to the deeply held conviction about the lives of the unborn, millions of conscientious Americans also support pro-life legislation and reasonable restrictions on the abortion practice because it is pro-women to do so. The abortion industry itself presents very real dangers for millions who are in difficult circumstances. I bring firsthand knowledge of those dangers to this hearing today. Prior to my election to Congress, I spent a good portion of my 20-year legal career in the courts defending common sense pro-life legislation when those laws were challenged and litigating to protect vulnerable women who were irreparably harmed by the notorious practices of the abortion industry. In fact, I was co-counsel in the trial of, of one of the the cases that the chairman's hearing memo today laments was upheld by the Fifth Circuit in 2018. Over the course of my career, we uncovered and made public shocking evidence, including the documented use of rusted surgical instruments, filthy and dangerous conditions in the clinics, unlicensed doctors engaging in physical and emotional abuse of patients, falsified health records, and so much more. I've spent many hours with and conducted extraordinary dep depositions of abortion providers some of whom boasted about personally performing tens of thousands of abortions each. Their callous disregard for the barbarism of their practice and the countless precious lives they terminated merely for cash was always stunning to me. To so many of these abortion providers, women are merely objects and a source of revenue, and state health and safety regulations put in place to protect those vulnerable women are mere nuisances to be blatantly ignored. There is no one in this room that can tell me otherwise because I have seen and heard and documented all this in court records myself. Today, we also have indisputable scientific evidence and advanced medical technology like 4D ultrasounds that clearly affirm the humanity of every unborn child. We know that when a human sperm meets and fertilizes a human egg, at the moment of conception, 
there becomes an unborn, living, genetically distinct, and biologically self-directed human being. That is an uncontroversial statement among embryologists and those who practice modern medicine generally. In other words, there is no such thing as a potential human being. There are only human beings from the moment of conception. But today we see lawyers and politicians and activists straining logic and language past the breaking point for political reasons. They do their very best to avoid phrases like unborn child and try to defend and deny the gruesome reality of abortion, which expert witnesses have previously described before this very subcommittee as a typical procedure in which a living human being is literally and brutally ripped to pieces limb by limb. When I served in the Louisiana legislature, I authored and passed a ban on the barbaric dismemberment abortion procedure in my state. Of course, the abortion lobby immediately challenged it in court. Over the past several months, we've all witnessed liberals in high political office move aggressively to further expand abortion rights, even after the point when an unborn child can clearly live outside the womb on its own. The United States, by the way, you should know, is one of only seven nations, including North Korea and China, that allows elective abortions after 20 weeks, a practice that kills thousands of innocent babies every year. New York's Reproductive Health Act allows all abortions up to 24 weeks and expanded access for later abortions. There's proposed legislation in Virginia, as we all now know, that the bill's sponsor said would allow abortion even during labor. And Virginia Governor Ralph Northam infamously endorsed allowing physicians and mothers to let children die in some circumstances. When Senate Republicans in this Congress pressed for a vote on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, federal legislation that the House has passed in previous years that would simply require doctors to provide medical care to babies born alive after failed abortion procedures, Incredibly, 45 Senate Democrats voted to block its further consideration and passage in the Senate. I stood in the back of the Senate chamber that night with dozens of our Republican colleagues, and we could not believe what we were watching. Mr. Chairman, this hearing is entitled Threats to Reproductive Rights in America, but rights must be accompanied by responsibilities. In this case, that responsibility includes our duty to protect unborn human beings. As the Declaration acknowledges, this is the first and most fundamental obligation of any civilized people. My own mother had just turned 17 when she and my father decided to choose life and allow me into the world, and I'm so grateful that they did. Countless millions of young women have made that, made that same blessed choice, and their children are equally thankful. For women in vulnerable situations who have made the opposite decision and lived to regret it, I just want to say personally that you too are valued and loved, and that creator who gave us our inalienable rights is so gracious that he offers hope, forgiveness, and redemption to every single one of us. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses here today. We do thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent that the full committee members, Ms. Roby and Ms. Lesko, be allowed to sit on our subcommittee today. Without objection, that will be done. Thank you. I yield back. I want to thank the ranking member for his statement. He is, uh, his positions are different from mine, but they're heartfelt and they're sincere. And another member who has heartfelt and sincere opinions and beliefs is Ms. Judy Chu of California. She's here, and I want to recognize her for her attendance and her support. And now I want to recognize the chairman of the full committee, one of the leading uh, voices for many, many years for women's rights and choice uh, in the Constitution, the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Chandler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Cohen, for convening this hearing to address the ongoing assault against women's reproductive rights that we are witnessing across the nation. This country has reached a crisis point for women's constitutional rights to control their own bodies and their own reproductive choices. States have passed unconstitutional bill after unconstitutional bill, imposing new extreme restrictions on abortion, setting the most direct challenge to Roe v. Wade we have seen in decades. In the month of May alone, Alabama outlawed abortion outright, making no exceptions even in cases of rape or incest. Georgia and Louisiana effectively outlawed abortion at just six weeks into a pregnancy, and Missouri outlawed abortion just eight weeks into a pregnancy. These laws will, in many instances, ban abortions before women even know they are pregnant. Meanwhile, the new conservative majority in the Supreme Court upheld portions of an extreme anti-abortion law from Indiana, and the last abortion clinic in Missouri came to the brink of being forced to close its doors after the state refused to issue its license. Had a court not intervened, Missouri would have been the first state, but surely not the last, without a single abortion clinic. Let me add a word here uh, about uh, some of the rhetoric we have heard already today. The rhetoric from the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee is heartfelt and sincere. It is also arrogant that it seeks to impose his and certain other people's moral commitments on everybody else who, don't, 
on people who don't share those moral opinions. The power of the state should not be used by one segment of society to impose its moral or religious beliefs on another segment of society. It should not, political power should not be fought over as to who can control other people's religious and moral convictions and the actions stemming therefrom. That is the fundamental question in this whole fight. After decades of chipping away at the right to an abortion, states now realize that the new conservative majority in the Supreme Court presents an opportunity either to overturn Roe completely or to so radically undermine the right to an abortion as to render it essentially meaningless. But the need for safe legal abortion will never be meaningless. The right to have an abortion is fundamental to women's equality, autonomy, and personal liberty. Making decisions about when and how to start a family is central to women's lives and is their decisions, not Congress's, not some state legislators. As the Supreme Court put it 27 years ago, when it upheld Roe after nearly two decades of challenges, quote, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives, close quote. We will not go backward. If women cannot make decisions about their reproductive health, they cannot make decisions about starting a career, going to school, opening a business, and planning their lives. When you restrict access to abortion, you strip women of the fundamental freedom to live life on their own terms. The last few weeks have seen an all-out frontal attack on the right of every woman in this country to access abortion. But this fight is not new, and these laws have not come out of nowhere. The bans and rest extreme restrictions enacted in states like Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana, as well as in many others, represent some of the most extreme legislation coming from the states. But over the last decade, state legislatures have passed hundreds of bills designed to block women from accessing care and from making their own choices. These laws impose medically unnecessary re regulations on doctors and on clinics, right down to the clinic's physical dimensions. Some states have even gone so far as to require women who receive abortions by taking a pill rather than, through, rather than through surgery to take that pill inside a clinic that must meet the standards of a full surgical facility. Under the disingenuous, disingenuous claim that these types of laws protect women's health, these states are deliberately attempting to put abortion out of reach, particularly for low-income women and women of color. The result is predictable. Many women will get abortions, illegal abortions, medically unsafe abortions, and the death rate will go up. These laws set arbitrary and unnecessary waiting periods that force women to take extra time off to work and delay care. They require unnecessary tests and biased counseling that do nothing but drive up the cost of abortion care. They set arbitrary regulations for, they set arbitrary regulations for providers that are designed solely to force clinics to close. And most egregiously, they are designed to intimidate and shame women for ever making the constitutionally protected choice to have an abortion. And this is not only happening in the states. Here in the United States Congress, the Republican-controlled Senate is considering a ban on abortion after 20 weeks, a bill that has no basis in science and is prima facie unconstitutional. Meanwhile, the current administration has taken every opportunity to undermine the right to access abortion and even contraception. It seems every other week the administration nominates a new anti-choice federal judge or official promulgates yet another rule undermining access to birth control or ending on biased family planning services, and denounces yet another new policy to protect those who discriminate against patients seeking an abortion rather than protecting the patients themselves. Enough is enough. Congress must now stand up with women and men around the country to say we will not turn back the clock We will not turn back the clock on women's constitutional rights and women's autonomy. It is my hope that today's hearing is Congress' first step toward shoring up the right to abortion across this country through legislation like Representative Judy Chu's Women's Health Protection Act, which would put an end to states banning or otherwise limiting access to abortion, Representative Barbara Lee's Each Woman Act, which would end abortion coverage bans or other legislative initiatives. We must act to ensure that every woman, regardless of state, income, race, or any other factor, retains her constitutional right to make her own choice and to access abortion. Women must have the freedom to make decisions about their lives without anyone questioning their intellect, their morals, or their honesty. I stand with the members of the committee and millions of women and men the around this country ready to fight for that freedom. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Uh, Mr. Collins is at the end of the table. He is the ranking member of the committee, and he's now recognized for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate that. The title of this hearing is Threats to Reproductive Rights in America. The rights mentioned in the title refer to the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade. As members of the Judiciary Committee, it is appropriate to examine why the test of time has exposed Roe as a failure in the viable judicial precedent. As mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and friends, it's necessary to consider why Roe is a failure of compassion for both women and children. While Roe asserts a woman's right to privacy anchors her right to an abortion, abortion destroys the right to life, along with liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and all other constitutional rights of the children it kills. It's impossible to imagine the framers intending the right of privacy to eclipse so one of the self-evident, unalienable rights that motivated the birth of our nation. Contending an unborn child has no life to lose becomes impossible when we reflect even momentarily on what abortion entails, and I'm grateful for our witnesses today who are here to give us a look at the lies abortions would have snuffed out. These witnesses were, are not alone in recognizing the humanity of an unborn child. In her dissenting opinion in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, Justice Ginsburg argued that compared compared to a partial birth abortions, the common dismemberment abortion method could have equally been characterized as brutal, involving, as it does, tearing a, a part of fetus and ripping off its limbs. Let us then be honest. Let us not speak of abortion as a victimless crime. At best, abortions aim to ease one person's suffering at the expense of another person's existence. We must cultivate compassion and practical support for women who find themselves pregnant under difficult or oppressive circumstances, and we must protect the, the most defenseless humans among us, those living in the womb. One person's reproductive right cannot outweigh another person's right to live. Justice Ginsburg also took issue with Roe on legal grounds. As a law professor, she wrote, Roe, I believe, would have been more acceptable as a judicial decision if it had not gone beyond the ruling of the statute before the court. Heavy-handed judicial intervention was difficult to justify. Other pro-choice legal experts have also voiced concerns with the foundation of this decision. Edward Lazarus, a former clerk to Justice Blackmun, who wrote the majority opinion in Roe, said, as a matter of constitutional interpretation and judicial method, Roe borders on the indefensible. I say this as someone who utterly committed to the right to choose. The problem is that Roe has little connection to the constitutional right it purportedly interpreted. A constitutional right to privacy broad enough to include abortion has no meaningful foundation in the constitutional text, history, or precedent. Mr. Lazarus went on to say, as a matter of constitutional interpretation, even most liberals, if you administer truth theorem, will tell you it's basically indefensible. Jeffrey Rosen, currently, formerly the, of the New Republic and currently the president of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, wrote, 30 years after Roe, the finest constitutional minds in the country still have not been able to produce a constitutional justification for striking down restrictions on early term abortions that are substantially more convincing than, Harry, than Justice Harry Blackmun's famously artless opinion itself. As a result, the pro-choice majority asked nominees to swear allegiance to the decision without being able to identify an intelligible principle to support it. Kermit Roosevelt, a law professor at Penn Law School said, it's time to admit that the, in public that as an example of practice of constitutional opinion writing, Roe is a serious disappointment. As constitutional argument, Roe is barely coherent. The court pulled its fundamental right to choose more or less from the constitutional either. As a result of Roe's lack of legal justification, the Supreme Court has since limited its effect. 1992's Planned Parenthood v. Casey permitted states to regulate abortions in the first trimester or at any stage before fetal viability, provided that they don't impose an undue burden on a woman's right to an abortion. In 2003, Congress banned partial birth abortions, which none, of the other, which none other than Justice Ginsburg had called brutal. In a partial birth abortion, a living baby was delivered, feet first, skull crushed before its chin clears the uterus moments before live birth is complete. 2007, the Supreme Court upheld the federal ban, which applied at any point during pregnancy in Gonzales v. Carhart, ruling the federal law did not impose an undue burden on a woman's right to an abortion. Justice Kennedy's majority opinion noted the law expresses respect for the dignity of human life and affirmed the government's interest in protecting the medical profession's integrity. He wrote, the government may use its voice, its regulatory authority, to show its profound respect for the life within the woman. Mr. Chairman, the decades since Roe v. Wade has repeatedly delivered legal decisions making it clear any threat to Roe is posed by illogical majority opinion. Before I finish, however, I will have to take exception with my chairman of the full committee. To call the ranking member of this subcommittee arrogant for expressing his personal beliefs while at the same time sitting hypocritically stating your own beliefs from a belief that I would assume come from a moral or civic background is the height of hypocrisy. At this point in time, we can disagree, 
But at least if we're going to call it, call the balls and strikes the same way. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Collins. We welcome our witnesses and thank them for participating in today's hearing. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask you to summarize your statement and your testimony in five minutes. You got a lighting system in front of you. The green light means you're going. The yellow light means you got one minute left and the red light means over. Uh, stay within that limit. You've got those lights. Uh, before proceeding, I remind each of you that all of your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to penalty of perjury pursuant to the USC 18-1001 could result in the imposition of fine or imprisonment up to five years or both. Our first witness is Ms. Melissa Murray. She is a professor of law and co-director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network at New York University School of Law, where she teaches con law, family law, criminal law, reproductive rights, and justice, among other courses. Her publications have appeared or are forthcoming in the California Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, the Harvard Law Review, the Michigan Law Review, the Penn Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, and the Virginia Law Review. I don't see how you have time to teach all those courses. She's an author of Cases on Reproductive Rights and Justice, the first case book to cover the field of reproductive rights and justice. And prior to joining the NYU faculty, she was on the faculty at the University of California Berkeley School of Law and served as an interim dean there. Professor Murray received her JD from Yale. She has, was notes development editor of the Yale Law Journal. After law school, she clerked for the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, then a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and for the Honorable Stephan Underhill of the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut. She received her undergraduate degree from the basketball powerhouse University of Virginia, and she's recognized now for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cohen. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Johnson, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today in these hearings on threats to reproductive rights in the United States. I am Melissa Murray, a professor of law at New York University School of Law. I will now recount my credentials as Mr. Cohen is the best PR man that I could have on this subject. So let me get right to it. In 1973, in Roe v. Wade, the United States Supreme Court recognized that the 14th Amendment's guarantee of liberty protects a woman's right to determine whether to bear or beget a child. Since then, the United States Supreme Court has consistently affirmed a woman's right to choose an abortion as an essential aspect of the Constitution's guarantees of liberty and equality. In so doing, the court has held that states may not restrict abortion in ways that are unduly burdensome. More precisely, states may not enact legislation that has the purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion. And indeed, as recently as 2016, the court in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt reiterated this commitment to upholding abortion rights. There, the court struck down two Texas laws and specifically noted that the undue burden standard was not a permissive endorsement of the state's purported rationales for regulating abortion. Instead, reviewing courts are obliged to review the state's purported justifications and determine independently if the challenged restrictions are appropriate measures to achieve the desired legislative ends. Still, despite these long-standing precedents, state legislatures have continued to test the Constitution's limits by enacting increasingly restrictive abortion laws. These laws make abortion less accessible and more costly. They purport to promote and protect women's health, but in fact, these laws are part of a larger effort to legislate abortion out of existence through piecemeal attacks. Recent changes in the composition of the U.S. Supreme Court and the lower federal courts have further emboldened those seeking to limit a woman's right to choose an abortion. In the last year, efforts to restrict abortion have taken on a more aggressive and extreme posture, flouting the limits that the Supreme Court has consistently recognized. Those responsible for these new laws have made their intentions clear. They are no longer content to chip away at the abortion right through piecemeal legislation, and instead, these more recent laws are an obvious provocation designed to relitigate and ultimately to overturn Roe v. Wade. The prospect of overturning Roe v. Wade is the most obvious threat to reproductive rights. 
But it is not the only threat, nor is it even the most immediate threat. Even if Roe versus Wade is not overturned, there are a number of cases currently pending in the pipeline to the Supreme Court that concern access to abortion. The laws challenged in these cases do not challenge Roe directly, but rather seek to strangle access to abortion, putting this fundamental right out of reach. They are part of this well-worn strategy to dismantle abortion rights through a death by a thousand cuts. If these laws are upheld, whether by the Supreme Court or the lower federal courts, their impact will be profound, particularly for our most underserved communities. These communities include individuals struggling to make ends meet, women of color, particularly African American, Latinx, Asian American and Pacific Islander and Native women, rural women, immigrant women, individuals in the LGBTQ community, parents who already have children, and young people. These constituencies already face enormous barriers to obtaining reproductive care, basic health care, and economic security. Threats to abortion access further exacerbate these pressures. Barriers to health care, including reproductive care, go hand in hand with economic insecurity. The affordable housing crisis, food insecurity, the lack of clean water, the lack of affordable childcare, the wage gap, which is more pronounced for women of color, the lack of paid family leave, a stagnant minimum wage, all of these issues lead to and compound economic insecurity for underserved communities across this country. These barriers have only increased under this presidential administration. For all of these reasons, I urge the subcommittee to keep these urgent threats and these underserved constituencies in mind as you consider ways to support and protect the constitutional right to abortion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Our, our next witness is Ms. Busy Phillips. She's a best-selling author, an actress, a writer, and a host of a late-night talk show. She's appeared in a number of movies and television shows. Last month, she revealed in her talk show that she had had an abortion when she was a teenager. She's been a vocal advocate for abortion rights, a brave lady, and we recognize her for five minutes. Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, thank you for having this important conversation and for inviting me to be a part of it. My name is Busy Phillips. I am many things. I am a mother of two wonderful girls, age 10 and 5. I am a professional actor for over 20 years. I am a New York Times bestselling author. I am a wife. I am a daughter. I am a talk show host and a volunteer for various children's charities and my kids' schools. I am a sister and I am a best friend. I am also the one in four women in this country who have had an abortion. After the governor of Georgia signed Bill HB 481, which would ban abortion at six weeks before most women know they're pregnant, I felt compelled to share my own story on my television show and online. I had an abortion when I was 15 years old in my home state of Arizona in 1994. It was not a decision that I made lightly, but I have never for one moment doubted that it was the right decision for me. But so much has changed in Arizona and many other states since then. If I were that same 15-year-old in Arizona today legally, I would have to get parental consent. I would be forced to undergo a medically unnecessary ultrasound, go to a state-mandated in-person counseling session designed solely to shame me into changing my mind, and then take a state-mandated 24-hour time out to make sure I really know what I wanted. And finally, I would be forced to give the state a reason why. Well, here is mine. It is my body, not the state's. Women and their doctors are the ones that are in the best position to make informed decisions about what is best for them, no one else. Since I shared my story and I called on others to do so using the hashtag you know me on social media, the response has been overwhelming. I have heard from thousands with their own stories, women who were raped, people whose very wanted children had severe, severe fetal anomalies, women who were in abusive relationship, people whose birth control failed or who simply were not ready. 
I also heard from many women who had abortions before abortion was legal in 1973, putting themselves in dangerous circumstances. No bill that criminalizes abortion will stop anyone from making this incredibly painful decision. These bans will not stop abortion from happening, but they will drive women and girls and people into the shadows, which is what this has always been about, shaming and controlling women's bodies. In the week after I shared my story on my show, women were coming up to me in the street, in the supermarket, at my gym, with tears in their eyes, thanking me for my bravery. But the word brave didn't sit right with me. Why is it brave to speak to an experience that millions of people around the world throughout history have gone through? And then I realized it is considered brave because as women, we have been taught to feel shame about our bodies since birth. In my life, I've had many medical procedures, but no one has ever called me brave for talking about them. Abortion is healthcare and should not be treated as different from any other healthcare. I am so sad that we have to sit here in front of a row of politicians and give deeply personal statements because the why doesn't matter. It should not matter. I am a human being that deserves autonomy in this country that calls itself free and choices that a human being makes about their own bodies should not be legislated by strangers who can't possibly know or understand each individual circumstances or beliefs. I'm here today because I stand by the decision that I made when I was 15 years old. I am here today because my platform has allowed me to connect with thousands and thousands of people around the country that you represent who have made the same choice I have made, but who will not all get the same chance to talk to you directly. I'm here today to help destigmatize a legitimate medical procedure and continue to encourage women not to allow themselves to be shamed for their choices. And finally, I am here today for my two little girls, Birdie and Cricket. My dream for them is that they will live in a world in which women are truly equal with complete control over their own reproductive health. That is the dream I hold for all people, regardless of their privilege or parents or what state they live in. That dream is slipping further and further from reality with every ban passed. I hope that you, our elected leaders, can help us reverse the tide. Thank you. I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Dr. Owen Phillips, a friend from Memphis, Tennessee, who has come to visit me on many occasions about these issues and others. She's a professor at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. She's held that position since 2002. She's a fellow in the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and board certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the American Board for Medical Genetics. She received her MD from the University of Mississippi School of Medicine in 1980. She did her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Mississippi Medical School and her fellowship in reproductive genetics at the University of Tennessee in Memphis. She's also received a master's in public health degree, summa cum laude from the University of Memphis. She received her BS in chemistry from Millsaps. Welcome, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cohen, <clears throat> Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee, thank you again for inviting me to speak with this subcommittee today. My name is Owen Phillips. I am an obstetrician gynecologist from Memphis, Tennessee. I was asked to testify as to the barriers to care my patients experience because of existing restrictive abortion laws and to predict what further challenges might arise if even more restrictive abortion regulations become law. The first I can easily attest to. Tennessee has several laws that were passed under the guise of making abortion safer. None were backed by scientific evidence, and all have fulfilled their real purpose, making a safe and legal procedure harder to obtain. The 48-hour wait period requires many women to travel long distances twice to the clinics for face-to-face -face consenting, adversely affecting their job and childcare. The requirement that physicians provide abortion care have hospital privileges has prevented many experienced doctors from caring for their patients. My own hospital has bowed to perceived political pressure and severely limits the indication for abortions. 
None of these restrictions will likely prevent women from attaining the abortion they seek. They just make it harder for women to receive timely, efficient, and equitable abortion services. To answer the second question, what effects would more restrictive laws have, is harder to answer. I have been practicing since the 1980s. I am not old enough to have personally witnessed the tragedies my physician teachers recalled prior to the Roe decision. No one knows what the consequences will be because almost all doctors practicing now have assumed that safe and legal abortion would always be an option for their patients. Nevertheless, we physicians are fearful. Commonly, a diagnosis of preeclampsia is made in our unit. By definition, this diagnosis is made after 20 weeks. This is a life-threatening condition for which the treatment is delivery. Abortion is often recommended, and the timing of which is made by the doctor with the patient. No politi politician's opinion should be a part of that medical and personal decision making. But this is where we seem to be headed. And I agree with the Vice President of Health Policy at ACOG, who's opined that one contributing factor to the increasing rates of maternal mortality has been the favoring of fetal well being over that of the patient. Also typical of my experience is having the heartbreaking conversation with a couple that their pregnancy has a lethal condition, meaning the baby will die within the first few hours or days of life. The couple, after much anguish, may decide to have an abortion, or may not. But who among us feels they have the right to make that decision for them? Not me, but I assume people sitting in some state legislatures or maybe even some of you feel that you do. And it is not just OBGYNs who interface with the issue. The oncologist's decision to treat with cancer-curing drugs is affected by a woman's pregnancy. The cardiologists have to advise women that if they continue their pregnancy, they may or will die from their condition. It is a hard decision. But the woman may look at the young children she has and ask, what is the right thing for them? I would never deem myself so arrogant to make this decision for a woman. Yet politicians all over this country have decided that they have the right to do just that. Is this a religious cause? You know, I understand religious conviction. I was raised a Southern Baptist. I was taught to live by the Bible's teachings, love your neighbor as yourself, and judge not lest ye be judged. But these laws are not about law, love, and certainly not about refraining from judging others. Where is the ethical and moral high ground in risking a woman's life or well-being because she cannot make decisions about her own body, her family, and her well-being, whether or not to have a baby or safely terminate her pregnancy? Now, most of my patients may have medical conditions for pregnancy termination, but in my experience, every woman who makes this decision has a reason. Abortion is a part of health care and should remain safe, accessible, and legal without political interference. I agree with ACOG's recommendation that existing restrictive abortion laws should, quote, be immediately repealed. These laws do not seek to make abortion safer. They instead seek to punish the healthcare systems and doctors who provide abortion care, and above all, to punish the women who seek abortion services. The decision to have an abortion should be a woman's decision in consultation with her doctor, period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. Our next witness is Christina Bennett. She's the Communications Director of the Family <laughs> Institute of Connecticut. She's been active in the pro-life movement for 15 years. She's a licensed Christian minister and has served on prayer missions at a number of locations, including Washington, Atlanta, and several overseas countries. She has a BS in communications from Southern Connecticut State University. Ms. Bennett, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, Chairman Cohen, Marking, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my story with you today. In 1981, my mother scheduled to abort me at Mount Sinai Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut. She was pressured by my father to abort and rejected by a mentor in her church who told her she wasn't welcome anymore because she was pregnant out of wedlock. She met with a counselor at the hospital who assured her she was making the right decision, but didn't offer counsel on available alternatives. A black elderly janitor approached my mother after seeing her crying in the hospital hallway. She asked her if she wanted to have her baby. My mother said yes. She told her that God would give her the strength to have me. 
When she went to leave, my mother was called into the doctor's office, and she saw that he hadn't cleaned up the blood from the last abortion. She was disgusted and told him she wanted to keep me. He insisted that she go through with the abortion and said, you've already paid for this. You're just nervous. She repeated, I want my baby. And he yelled at her saying, don't leave this room. She felt his anger came from fear of losing her business and those that could possibly follow her. Yet with courage, she walked out. Children conceived less than a decade prior to my birth never experienced the threat of death through legalized abortion. It's easy for people to say, well, I'm glad your mother had a choice, but a statement like that devalues my existence and the reality of what that choice would have done to me. Human lives should not be weighed in the balance of whether or not they are wanted or measured in terms of circumstances or convenience. I deserved legal protection and a right to life. My mother's experience is similar to the experiences I've heard from women throughout this country. Women who face the same rejection, pressure, lack of counseling, lack of support, and disgusting facility conditions. My desire to assist women and children led me to work for years at a nonprofit pregnancy resource center. And there I witnessed the power of hope and the ways in which love and practical support can strengthen women and their families. Two years ago, I had a profound experience while visiting the National Museum of African American History. I was reminded of the ways black Americans were denied the right to equal protection and due process, treated as property and dehumanized because of the color of our skin. The museum memorialized the many ways black Americans have been unjustly targeted and killed for centuries. And while I rejoice over the progress that we've made as people of color, an ache remains in my heart because of the denial of equal protection and due process to another class of people, the baby in the womb. The sacrifices my ancestors suffered to achieve the civil rights I enjoy today are not able to protect future generations because of legalized abortion. I'm burdened that the 14th Amendment, which gave us liberty, was unjustly used to invent a supposed right to destroy a human life. Sojourner Truth in her day said, am I not a woman? And in mine I say, am I not a person? Abortion is not a victimless act. We just can't hear the voices of those who have been silenced and discarded. Roe v. Wade rendered 60 million lives unworthy of legal protection and has led to the deaths of 20 million black babies since 1973. In the dark history of Planned Parenthood, founder Margaret Sanger's philosophy in eugenics was recently documented by Supreme Court Justice Thomas in his concurring opinion about Fox versus Planned Parenthood. And today, an increasing number of black Americans recognize this eugenic population control philosophy that is having a genocidal impact. 78% of Planned Parenthood surgical facilities are located in black and Latino neighborhoods. And black women such as Cree Irwin, Lakeisha Wilson, and Tanya Reeves have lost their lives at the hand of an abortion industry that offered them substandard medical care. Others have left by ambulance, suffered botched procedures, and been left with physical and emotional scars. And we're tired of the targeting and the lies that abortion is an answer to our challenges. As a pro-life feminist, I support bodily autonomy, but abortion impacts two bodies. I am a unique individual, and just as my heart is beating today, it was beating inside of my mother's body. I was not just a part of her body. And liberation never comes through oppressing other human beings. Roe v. Wade was built on lies that Norma McCorvey spent her entire life trying to correct. We can love both women and children and strive for a society that treats us all with the dignity we deserve. And this is true empowerment. Thank you, Ms. Minna. Welcome. Ms. Melissa Oden is an anti-abortion activist. In 2012, she founded the Abortion Survivors Network and has previously testified before the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. She's worked as a speaker for Feminist for Life. You're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Cohn, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the committee, I just want to thank you for inviting me to this hearing. As the now famous saying goes, women's rights are human rights. I'm here today to give a face and a voice to women whose rights are not just being threatened, but have been under attack for the past 46 years in our country and are clearly being even more heavily threatened 
as abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy with no restriction are being introduced and celebrated in states like New York, Illinois, and now Nevada. Today, you've heard countless stories already about how abortion is a difficult yet necessary decision, how every woman has the fundamental right to abortion. Every story is important. Every experience deserves to be heard. However, when we hear the stories about abortion, this narrative is woefully one-sided. Our culture has been inundated with messaging in which abortion controls the narrative. Yet largely ignored in this abortion narrative that is woven so skillfully throughout our culture, behind even the words in the title of this hearing, Reproductive Rights, are stories buried beneath the narrative of abortion that has been sown since Roe versus Wade. Is there space for stories like mine, women who are alive today after surviving failed abortion procedures? For stories like my biological mothers who have been coerced or forced into an abortion? Do we ever create space for the stories of women who regret their abortions? The most important stories, though, are those that you will likely never hear. The stories of the little girls who will never live outside of the womb. In all of this discussion about women's rights, some lose sight of the fact that without the right to life, there are no other rights. This is the greatest human rights issue we're facing as a country. And I'm here to tell you that in August of 1977, that's when the attack on my human rights began. My biological mother as a 19-year-old college student had a saline infusion abortion forced upon her by her own mother, a prominent nurse in their community, with the help of her friend and colleague, the local abortionist, Dr. Kelberg. That abortion procedure involved injecting a toxic salt solution into the amniotic fluid surrounding me in the womb. It was meant to poison and scald me to death. I soaked in that toxic salt solution over a five-day period as they tried time and time again to induce my birth mother's labor with me. When I was finally expelled from the womb on that fifth day of the abortion procedure, my arrival into this world was not so much as a birth, but an accident, a live birth after a saline infusion abortion. My medical records actually state a saline infusion for an abortion was done, but was unsuccessful. This record is available to you to review along with some other records that talk about how a complication of my birth mother's pregnancy was a saline infusion. Despite the arguments being made that people like me don't exist or that children aren't left to die after failed abortions, I need you to listen to the words of a nurse who I've been connected with who was there that day. I was initially laid aside after my grandmother instructed the nurses to leave me to die, and arguments ensued about whether I would be provided medical care. In the words of Nurse Jan, who received me in the NICU that day, a tall blonde nurse courageously rushed me off, shouting out, she just kept gasping for breath. And so I couldn't just leave her there to die. My medical records state that when I was delivered alive in that abortion procedure, I suffered from severe respiratory problems, jaundice, seizures. I weighed a little less than three pounds. I was two pounds, 14 ounces, which led a neonatologist to remark in my records that I was approximately 31 weeks gestation, as opposed to the 18 to 20 weeks that the abortionist had written on my medical records. It's easy to talk about women's reproductive rights until you recognize that without first the right to life, there are no other rights. How do you reconcile my rights as a woman who survived a failed abortion with what's being discussed here today. The abortion industry talks in abstract and gray when it comes to the science of when life begins and what abortion does, but the reality is much clearer. I'm alive today because someone else's reproductive right failed to end my life, as are the 287 abortion survivors I've connected with through my work in the Abortion Survivors Network. 184 of them are female. There's something wrong when someone's right results in another person's death. There's something, something deeply disturbing about the reality in our world that I have a right to an abortion, but I had never the simple right to live. As you examine the so-called threat to women's reproductive rights, I would ask you to look behind the language and see stories like mine that are hidden, that might seem inconvenient or rare, and consider there's more to this discussion. And there's more to be done to protect your most vulnerable constituents and meet the needs of women and families in our communities in a way that supports lives at all stages of development and in all circumstances, not ends it.
Thank you. Ms. Jennifer Dalvin is the director of the American Civil Liberties Union Reproductive Freedom Project. In that role, she oversees and directs the ACLU's litigation, state advocacy, and communications work on issues affecting access to reproductive health services. Prior to that, she was a staff lawyer at the ACLU for more than 10 years and then in private practice. She graduated magna cum laude from the NYU School of Law and served as law clerk for the Honorable Pierre Laval of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. We are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Cohen, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Jennifer Dalvin, and I'm the director of the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project. I've been litigating abortion cases for more than two decades, and I'm here to tell you that today we're facing a crisis. Since March, seven states have passed ban laws banning abortion. And make no mistake about it, this has happened because President Trump was able to put two new justices on the Supreme Court. And abortion opponents believe that this new court will take an extraordinary step of actually taking away one of our constitutional rights. That's a very real and very frightening possibility. But here's the thing. The court doesn't have to overturn Roe v. Wade in order for states to push abortion entirely out of reach. That's because these bans are just the culmination of a decades-long strategy, a strategy to pile restriction on top of restriction in order to make it near impossible for a person to get an abortion if they need one. Congress started by passing the Hyde Amendment which bans coverage for people insured through Medicaid. Representative Hyde openly admitted what his goal was. That was to prevent people with low incomes from being able to get abortion care they needed. State legislatures followed suit, and since the 2010 elections, states have quietly passed 479 medically unnecessary restrictions on abortion care. Lawyers at the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, and the Center for Reproductive Rights are challenging dozens of these restrictions in court. And while litigation is a powerful tool, it alone cannot stop the avalanche of restrictions. The unfortunate truth is that these restrictions have severely eroded access to care. So much so that for many today in our country, abortion is already more theoretical than real. This is particularly true for people with low incomes, people of color, immigrants, young people, and LGBTQ people. Kentucky's a good example of what's happening around the country. In the 1970s, there were 17 places in Kentucky where a person could get an abortion if they needed one. Today, because of hostile state action, there's only one. And Kentucky isn't alone. Six states have only a single abortion provider, and several more have only two or three. And yet there are efforts in Kentucky, Missouri, and other places to shut down even those last clinics. Like many others, Kentucky's governor, Governor Bevan, has been trying to use bogus health regulations to end abortion care in his state. And he would have been successful, but the sole clinic, EMW Women's Surgical Center, refused to abandon its patients. Instead, the ACLU and EMW rushed to court to get an emergency order stopping the governor from shutting down the clinic. After trial, the court found that the governor's regulations, quote, resulted in no benefit to patients. All they would do is make it impossible for a person to get an abortion in the state. But unfortunately, the state's appealed, and so the clinic's ability to keep caring for patients remains in jeopardy. Now, this was a prime strategy used before 2019, use phony health regulations to prevent people from getting abortions. But since Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation, states are increasingly dropping the pretense. Now they are making plain what their goal has been all along, which is to ban abortion entirely. Now, of course, these laws have never been motivated by a concern for women or families. If they were, Georgia wouldn't have one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the country, a rate that's three times higher for black women than it is for white women. If they were concerned about women and children, two-thirds of Alabama counties wouldn't lack a hospital that provides obstetrical care. If they were concerned about children, Alabama wouldn't have one of the highest infant death rates in the country. But instead of addressing these problems, these states are passing blatantly unconstitutional abortion bans. Now we must fight those bans, and we are. But at the same time, states are also continuing to quietly regulate away abortion access. It's happening in Missouri, which is on the verge of forcing the last clinic in the state to stop providing abortion care. 
It's happening in Louisiana, where unless the Supreme Court steps in, there will be only a single doctor left in the entire state eligible to provide abortion care. And it's happening in Alabama, where but for lawsuits brought by the ACLU on behalf of doctors like Dr. Uh, Robinson, every single clinic in the state would have been forced to close. That's why Congress must pass the Women's Health Protection Act. That bill would safeguard against not only outright bans, but also clinic shutdown laws and other restrictions that prevent people from getting care. As the mother of two fabulous children, I know that the decision about whether to become a parent is one of the most important ones we make in our lives. It's the job of our government to ensure that we can actually make real decisions, whether that's to continue a pregnancy or to end it in a way that is best for ourselves and our families. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Dr. Yashika Robinson, attending physician in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Alabama Women's Wellness Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where she has worked since 2005. She's a fellow of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and a National Health Service Corps Volunteer Scholar from 2000 to 2013. She received her MD from Morehouse School of Medicine, a recipient of three scholarships. She did a BA in Chemistry, Magna Cum Laude from Talladega College, she did a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Alabama School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Robinson, thank you, and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Dr. Yashika Robinson. I serve on the Board of Physicians for Reproductive Health, and I am an obstetrician gynecologist in Alabama. I have a busy obstetrics practice where I provide prenatal care, deliver babies, and treat mothers after they have given birth. I also provide abortion care at Alabama Women's Center. I provide abortion care because I believe that patients deserve the full spectrum of care. I came to this work because of my compassion for young people that is deeply connected to my own personal experience as a teen mother. Prior to finishing high school, I learned that I was pregnant. And as a result of fear and lack of resources, by the time I confided in my mother and grandmother, I had no choice, I was going to be a mother. Becoming a mother as a teenager came with many harsh realities. I love my children dearly, but I know that everyone should be able to make that decision for themselves. I have been in the shoes of many of the young people that I see in my clinic, and it is so important for them to know that regardless of their decision, that I am here to support them. Providing abortion care in Alabama is challenging, but it's also deeply satisfying. I'm proud to provide compassionate quality care when patients enter our doors. But I know that all too often that getting to our doors comes with many unnecessary obstacles. People have to travel long distances to come to our clinic. They receive outdated, state-mandated information, and then they are required to wait an additional 48 hours before I can provide them the care that they need. Low-income patients have an exceptionally hard time. These obstacles increase the overall cost of care including costs related to transportation, lodging, missing work, and childcare. I know that patients have slept in their cars overnight because they had no other options. Alabama also has a 20-week abortion ban, and patients needing care after that point have to travel out of state, which further increase costs. And young people have to navigate an onerous, time-intensive process to have an abortion if they can't involve a parent. I have cared for a 12-year-old who faced numerous delays before getting the final judicial approval necessary to proceed with the abortion she needed. Though I met her in her first trimester of pregnancy, she was well into the second trimester and nearly at the legal limit for being able to obtain an abortion in the state of Alabama by the time she navigated all of these hurdles. The near total ban on abortion that recently passed in Alabama, HB 314, imposes a 99-year prison sentence for a physician unless it is agreed that the abortion is needed for the life or meets an extremely narrow exception for the health of the woman. This ban, should it ever go into effect, would be disastrous for Alabamians. HB 314 is blatantly unconstitutional and would force doctors like me to choose between what is ethically, medically appropriate care and being criminalized. There is no other area of medicine where we have legislation threatening physicians with criminal prosecutions for simply doing their job. Alabama is already a state with an unconscionably high maternal and infant mortality rate. 
Nearly two-thirds of Alabama counties lack hospitals that offer obstetrical care. Moreover, the number of pregnancy-related deaths across the country is steadily increasing, and in Alabama, black women are nearly five times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than white women. Without access to safe abortion care, maternal mortality rates will rise even more. By attempting to criminalize abortion providers, we endanger women and we harm communities that are already lacking healthcare providers. This law would make doctors often split-second judgment calls potential criminal acts. This lack of autonomy may deter new physicians from coming to areas that already have a shortage of physicians and may cause others to leave. Alabama legislators made it very clear their ultimate goal is to outlaw abortion, period. This is dangerous as the consequences extend far beyond that. It will affect all providers who take care of pregnant women, not just abortion providers. Women and their doctors need access to the full spectrum of care as they manage undesired and complicated pregnancies. Regardless of how you feel about abortion, we cannot tie the hand of health care providers. Though HB 314 has not taken effect, it is negatively impacting patients already. I wish that you all could hear how worried patients are. One young lady told me of the nightmares that she had the night prior to coming into my clinic because she felt that she would be denied services because of these restrictive laws. In addition to legal obstacles, providers and patients face her constant harassment. To enter the clinic or my obstetric practice, patients have to walk through a line of protesters who yell hateful, dehumanizing, sometimes racially charged things. The hostility that we endure is completely unacceptable and has gotten worse over the past few years. Recently, a protester attempted to run over a volunteer with their vehicle. Needless to say, this harassment is unheard of for my colleagues who work in other fields of medicine. The bottom line is this, abortion is health care. Alabamians deserve better. I urge elected officials to show empathy for the lived experiences of people who need health care, be it abortion, miscarriage management, or prenatal care, for they all are connected. Health care should remain patient-centered, and all medical decisions should remain between a patient and her physician without any political interference. Thank you. You're welcome. I noticed several of you seemed shocked by the, we're used to it here. It was the ghost of Shirley Chisholm expressing her upset about the need for this hearing. <laughs> now I'd like to recognize H.K. Gray, who is an activist with Youth Testify, a program for the Advocates for Youth and the National Network of Abortion Funds. She wrote an opinion piece in Teen Vogue on abortion rights. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, and thank you to the chairman and ranking member for this opportunity to share my story and bring to light the very real ways restrictions to abortion access threaten our ability to make autonomous reproductive health decisions and raise the families we want. My name is H.K. Gray. I am 18 years old, and I came here today all the way from Fort Worth, Texas. I'm an activist with Youth Testify, a leadership program through Advocates for Youth and the National Network of Abortion Funds. It is an honor to be able to speak before you today. I became pregnant for the first time when I was 15 and had my daughter shortly after I turned 16. Immediately upon finding out I was pregnant, I knew I would continue the pregnancy. Despite a bit of preterm labor, my baby arrived right on time. She's in her terrible twos, and I love her. I am fortunate to have the incredible support of my fiance, but becoming a parent has had lots of challenges, like losing my friends and not being able to attend school. I've been on my own for a few years now because my father is homeless and my mother was incarcerated. They weren't in a situation to support me legally, financially, or emotionally. I know they love me, but they're unable to parent me the way I need them to, and the state requires. After having my daughter, I tried to get a Paragard IUD, but I was unable to because in Texas, in order to get birth control, I need my parents' consent, something I couldn't get due to my parents' situations. And although my doctor was sympathetic, she couldn't legally give it to me. A few months later, I became pregnant again, but I miscarried. 10 months after giving birth to my daughter, I realized I was pregnant for a third time. When I told my fiance, we both knew what the other was feeling. We couldn't afford a second child, and it was hard when I had to go back to work a week after having my daughter because I didn't have paid parental leave. Adoption wasn't the right decision for us because if I continued the pregnancy, I would have wanted to parent. And the WIC, SNAP, and Medicaid programs aren't enough as it is. When I tried to get an abortion, I didn't realize how hard it would be. 
Texas requires parental consent for anyone under 18 years old. It's not that my parents would have opposed to my decision. It's that they weren't physically able to give me the consent. This was a new concept to me because it's something I didn't have to do when I had my daughter. It seemed weird to me that I didn't need anyone's permission to become a parent, but I needed to prove to the state that, as a parent, I was mature enough to not have another child. Thankfully, I found Jane's Due Process, an organization that helped me find a clinic and connected me to a lawyer who walked me through the judicial bypass process. I had to get an ultrasound to take to court and prove how far along I was. A few weeks later, when I finally went to court, it was a long day, and honestly, it was very hard to me. The judge said some hurtful things about me being sexually active, being a young parent, and wanting an abortion. I felt shame no matter which decision I made. The judicial bypass process is a burden and barrier to abortion access. My actual abortion was pretty straightforward. The providers were kind and treated me like an adult, and I was glad to get back home to care for my daughter. The irony of this whole experience is that I could make medical decisions for my daughter, but not for myself. When I take my daughter to see a doctor, I'm treated like an adult, but I couldn't get routine care at the dentist or get birth, birth control without my parents' permission. I believe we need more support in this country for young women and transgender people who want to be able to access birth control or want to parent or want an abortion or, like me, needed all those things at different times in my teenage years. Government restrictions on abortion hurt those of us who have fewer resources or are people of color or undocumented or living with disabilities or poor or queer. In Texas, the state prohibits all types of health insurance from covering abortion care, and we have to pay out of pocket. I couldn't afford my abortion, but thankfully a family member lent me the money. Like me, most people seeking abortions are already parenting and are balancing paying for child care, food, and rent. In Texas, 96% of counties do not have abortion clinics, impacting nearly half of Texas women. We have to figure out how to take time off work or school to travel to get an abortion, find some place to stay, and pay for it all. We are forced to listen to government-mandated, medically inaccurate counseling and wait 24 hours and go to the doctor twice before getting an abortion. Unlike me, the majority of people who have abortions are people of color, and we must respect their decisions. I wish there were more support for people of color who are impacted by these restrictions harder than I am. We need more love and compassion for families and young people like me. I had a child, I had a miscarriage, and I had an abortion. As we, as we say at the National Network of Abortion Funds, everyone loves someone who had an abortion. Thank you for your time, and I hope my story helps you remember these laws that you pass impact your constituents like me and your loved ones who've had abortions. Thank you, Ms. Gray. We'll now enter the period of our hearing where each member has five minutes to ask questions, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Dr. Phillips, thank you for traveling here from Memphis and away from the land of best barbecue in the world to join us today. You've spoken about how some of Tennessee's laws, such as the 48-hour waiting period, make it difficult for women to obtain an abortion, particularly those who have to travel long distances for multiple visits. You've also spoken about how your hospital is bowed to political pressure and placed severe limits on access to abortion. What are those limits, and how have they affected patients in your care? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the hospital that I practice in um, has relatively arbitrarily limited abortion uh, to the case of rape, incest, and save the life of the mother. The issue is that the medical indication of saving the life of the mother is one that uh, requires a great uh, number of events to happen to actually prove um, and to document more than just prove. Uh, so we have delays. Um, cases have to be referred to the administration to consider. Um, many times there requires a number of medical uh, opinions to be documented. Um, and in the meantime, the pregnancy is advancing and advancing. And even though first and second trimester abortions are safe, certainly safer than having a baby, um, and certainly under these medical circumstances, safer than having a baby. Um, the delays are heart-wrenching for the patient and uh, for their families as they wait. Um, this is one of the big issues um, that we face um, all the time. Ms. Ms. Dalvin, uh, Dr. Phillips mentioned the three exceptions that are generally in the law. 
uh, rape, incest, or the life of the mother. Uh, in your knowledge of uh, laws of the, in the United States, do most states now see those three exceptions, except for these new wave of laws that do not consider those exceptions? You might need to turn your microphone up. You're absolutely right that uh, many of the new state bans lack exceptions um, for uh, rape and incest. Uh, that's certainly true in this, and the public is, is outraged. But the public's outraged by the bans themselves as they affect all women. That's why we saw people take to the streets in more than 500 cities and towns around the country in the middle of the week. Um, to express how concerned they were about bans like Alabama's and Ohio's and Kentucky's um, and Georgia's, where we are seeing politicians increasingly um, step away from this old argument that they were just trying to protect women's health or just trying to ensure that decisions are informed. Now what we're seeing is people just taking this way, decision entirely out of the hands of women. It's interesting that with the exception of Ohio, the states that have been the worst on these laws are the same states that had miscegenation laws, the same states that made it difficult to vote and were suspect states in the Voting Rights Act, and, uh, and left the country somewhat unpatriotic of them. Uh, Professor Murray, you've explained in your testimony that the reasoning in Roe v. Wade was part of a long line of cases recognizing a right to privacy a right to make one's own personal decisions in certain areas of life, including people's choice who they want, might want to marry, same sex, et cetera, and the rights of parents to direct the upbringing of their children. If Roe were overturned, in what ways could those other rights be threatened? Chairman Cohen, you're absolutely right that Roe versus Wade proceeds from a long provenance of cases. It was not conjured out of whole cloth, but rather proceeds from a series of decisions that were enacted in the 1920s. Right, Meyer versus Nebraska, Pierce versus Society of Sisters, all of which held that parents have the right to the upbringing of their children, an upbringing of their choosing. From those protections, we get Griswold versus Connecticut, the right to privacy and the right to use contraception. From there, we have Roe versus Wade, and from there, we have Lawrence versus Texas, the right to engage in consensual adult sexual relationships, and then from there, Obergefell versus Hodges in 2015, which affirms the right to marry a person of the same sex, and of course, as you say, 1967, Loving versus Virginia. All of these are predicated on the same judicial founding, and if Roe falls, all of these other decisions are equally imperiled. Thank you, Professor Murray. Uh, scary to think that we could go back to that era and all those things we consider rights and advancements would fall and we'd be back in the dark ages. Uh, recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've heard some compelling testimony today. It's heartfelt on both sides and we expected that. And I appreciate the civil tone of the dialogue. It's important for us as an American people. Look, there's a gallery full of young people here today, and I just want to say one thing before I get to my questions. I want to encourage all of you to examine the evidence for yourself. I had an eighth grade teacher one time that told me that what is, what is popular isn't always right, and what is right isn't always popular. And you owe it to yourself to do your own homework. One of the majority witnesses uh, today said something that really struck me. She said, quote, I am a human being that deserves autonomy in this country that calls itself free. Okay, but review the facts for yourself and you'll see that the indisputable scientific evidence now shows us that when a human sperm meets and fertilizes a human egg at the moment of conception, there becomes an unborn, living, genetically distinct and biologically self-directing human being. The question is, you should ask yourself quietly, why shouldn't each of those human beings deserve autonomy in this country that calls itself free. Let me, let me get to my questions. Ms. Bennett, thank you for being here. Your testimony is compelling, and I appreciate you included in your statement Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's concurring opinion in the Box case. I, I wanted to read a, a quick excerpt from that opinion. He said, quote, this case highlights the fact that abortion is an act rife with the potential for eugenic manipulation. From the beginning, birth control and abortion were promoted as a means of effectuating eugenics. Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger was particularly open about the fact that birth control could be used for eugenic purposes. These arguments about the eugenic potential for birth control apply with even greater force to abortion, which can be used to target specific children with unwanted characteristics. 
even after World War II. Future parent, Planned Parenthood President Alan Guttmacher and other abortion advocates endorsed abortion for eugenic reasons and, and promoted it as a means of controlling the population and improving its quality. A growing body of evidence suggests that eugenic goals are already being realized through abortion. Then he says this, eight, eight decades after Margaret Sanger's, quote, Negro Project, abortion in the U.S. is also marked by a considerable racial disparity. The reported nationwide abortion ratio, the number of abortions per 1,000 live births, among black women is nearly 3.5 times the ratio for white women. Continuing to quote Justice Thomas, and there are areas in New York City in which black children are more likely to be aborted than they are to be born alive. And they're up to eight times more likely to be aborted than white children in the same area. The question is, why do you believe the black community is being targeted by the abortion industry? Thank you for the question. If you look at the history of the American Birth Control League, which later became Planned Parenthood, you will see that Margaret Sanger had this pseudoscience that she believed in eugenics philosophy. And it wasn't just her, it was also members of her board. One of her board members was named Lothrop Stoddard, and he had a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White Supremacy. And it was all about how mixed races were growing and that was a threat to white supremacy. And you have to ask yourself, what would a man like that, who wrote a book like that, why would he be interested in the birth control movement, particularly with targeting people of color? It was because they believed that certain people groups should prosper and grow, and that would be a betterment to society, and other groups should not. And that was seen clearly in the writings of Margaret Sanger when she talked about people of color like weeds that should be exterminated. And she also had something called the Negro Project, in which she manipulated you know, black ministers and people of color to go into their communities and to push birth control. Unfortunately, she also pushed sterilization. There's women today, like an African-American friend, I have Elaine Riddick, who was sterilized in North Carolina after having one child. And she was told by doctors, we don't want you to reproduce after your own kind. America has a dark history and it involves racism. And now we see 78% of Abortion facilities, Planned Parenthoods, are located in lower income minority neighborhoods. There's a great resource on protecting black life where they lay out the map of the United States and you can go to that website and you can see the different areas that are targeted. And this is why people of color are standing up. The Church of God in Christ is the largest uh, black denomination in America with over six million members. And recently they have started a, a movement to stand up against the targeting of the African American community, as well as a movement of adoption, encouraging their members to adopt. I will also say that African American women being three times more likely to abort, it's not because we desire to have abortions more than anyone else, it's because we often feel like we don't have the resources, we don't have the support that we need. And so things do need to change. We do need um, help and support in these areas. People should not be pressured like my mom was. People should not feel like they have to choose abortion because they don't have the resources to take care of themselves or to take care of their families. And so a lot has to change in order for us to truly be able to have equality in this country and not be targeted because of our lack of resources and who we are. I greatly regret that I'm out of time, but I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Nadler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Professor Murray. Um, there's been uh, some suggestion, more than suggestion this morning, that efforts to provide abortion care are linked to an agenda based on eugenics and are designed to control minority populations. As someone who has studied the history of reproductive rights in this country, what's your response to that argument? I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to clarify the record. Like Ms. Bennett, I too have studied this history, and she's absolutely correct that the history of eugenics in this country is laced with the taint of racism, but it goes in both directions. Not only was eugenics used to promote the use of contraception and sterilization, it was also used to promote abortion, but from the other side. In the 1800s, when the first laws criminalizing abortion were enacted, it was because of nativist anxieties that native-born white women were not having as many children as their darker-hued immigrant sisters, who were having too many. So the early effort to criminalize abortion is actually part of a vestige to overwhelm immigrant populations with native-born white births. I will also note, um, in response to Ms. Bennett's testimony, that adoption is an option, but African-American children are the ones who are most likely to linger in the child welfare system and in foster care are, in the, least, and are the least likely to be adopted. Thank you. And uh, it's true that eugenics is also a motivating factor, is it not, 
in much of the uh, anti-immigration legislation. We've got to keep out the Jews, the Italians, the Slavs, and other Eastern Europeans in the early 20th century. Is that not the, not the case? That is the case. My colleague at Berkeley, Jerome Carabell, documents some of that in his accounts of higher education in the United States. Thank you. Now, last November, a federal judge blocked Mississippi's ban on abortion after 15 weeks. The ruling was unequivocally unconstitutional. The court described that law as closer to the old Mississippi, the Mississippi bent on controlling women and minorities. You've already spoken about how, how restrictions on access to abortion fall disproportionately on women of color. Could you describe some ways in which an outright ban on access to abortion would impact women of color and other vulnerable uh, populations, Professor? Women of color continue to bear the brunt of the burden of the restrictions on abortion access. Um, they are often the most likely to be victims of economic insecurity and will not have the opportunity to travel, to go to places where they're able to get more liberalized access to abortion. Um, they will also be more likely to have employment insecurity and not be in positions where they can take time off of work. They may also already be mothers to children and will have a difficulty obtaining childcare in order to comply with the waiting period and things of that nature. All of this is compounded by African-American women's limitations in access to health care, the high rate of maternal morbidity in this country, and the high rate of infant mortality among African-American children. Thank you. And, uh, Professor, the judge in that case also wrote that the state's professed interest in women's health care is pure gaslighting, unquote. This judge recognized the pretext for what it is. But now the case is on appeal to the Fifth Circuit, a court that's conservative to begin with now is five extreme right-wing judges appointed by President Trump. What are some of the ways in which judges who want to reach a particular political outcome could twist the facts in cases involving restrictions on access to abortion? Well, Chairman Nadler, we've already seen um, episodes where courts have consistently flouted the extant precedents of the Supreme Court. So in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt in 2016, this court struck down a Texas admitting privileges law that basically helped close a number of clinics in Texas. It was struck down in that case. Almost immediately after, the state of Louisiana passed a virtually similar admitting privileges law. Again, as we've heard today, these admitting privileges laws are often unnecessary in the case of abortion because abortion pro providers don't often have to admit their patients to hospitals because the procedure is so safe. So we've already seen in that Louisiana case, June Services, which is currently pending on cert before the Supreme Court, an effort by the Fifth Circuit, again, to flout the precedents that this court has articulated. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dalvin, most state legislatures that are imposing extreme restrictions on abortion or outright bans are targeting the doctors for criminal penalties rather than the patients. Uh, although uh, President Trump uh, slipped up during the campaign, he said uh, the patients should be arrested and jailed. It's apparently no longer acceptable to say you'll put women in prison for receiving an abortion. Can you, can you describe why these laws would still end up punishing women who seek abortions? It, would, it can punish women in multiple ways. First, if there's no constitutional right to abortion, if, there is, if the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe versus Wade, there would be nothing to stop states from going after women and punishing women. The fact that they're not saying that today doesn't mean that they won't say that tomorrow. Um, second, these laws do punish women by preventing them from getting the care that they need. These laws, a ban on abortion is a punishment for a woman who needs one. We, and we know in states like Georgia and Alabama, it's particularly galling. These states have some of the highest maternal mortality rates in the country. These are states that lack appropriate health care. They lack OBGYNs. They lack obstetrical departments. And Georgia is one of the states in this country who has refused to expand Medicaid coverage to ensure that people can get the health care that they need. So bans on abortion, forcing people to stay pregnant against their will, is a punishment, aside from the criminal punishment that could uh, befall women if Roe is overturned. Let me ask one further question. Uh, if a court adopted a constitutional analysis that uh, bans on abortion are perfectly okay because majorities don't like them, um, is there any difference that would prevent constitutionally a state from passing a ban on uh, blood transfusions or uh, open heart surgery, for example? Is there any juridical difference? Uh, 
That, that's a question you're, I, have, I have not considered, but it would certainly um, be concerning if the state could step in and say that and take um, medical practice out of the hands of doctors and uh, ensure that um, and prevent patients from getting the care that they need. Thank you. My time has expired. Mr. Gomert, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And I've been very pleased to hear some things made by our full committee chairman in this hearing, uh, like the statement just made or the question, because uh, I recall President Obama saying in the White House at a town hall meeting that uh, under his Obamacare pro uh, program, a woman who had gotten a um, pacemaker that kept her alive for over a decade, uh, best thing would just give her a pain pill. Um, so I'm glad to know that he now believes the state should not prevent someone like that from getting the health care they need. Um, Ms. Oden, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm curious, you had shared in your testimony your birth mother's abortion was forced upon her. Um, have you heard of any other cases where potential birth mothers uh, or women that are um, talking about a potential abortion had to deal with pressure to get an abortion? Thank you for your question. It's correct. My biological mother, I now know, was forced to have this abortion. I didn't find that out until about six years ago now. My birth mother is now a huge part of my life. She's a great support to me. Um, but I face the reality every day of the fact that not only was my life supposed to end, but this is not something she wanted. And I know that she's not alone in that. There was a study done recently where 48% of women identified being coerced into their abortion. And again, I, I just want to thank all of the women for being here today. I know we have differing experiences and differing opinions, but I think we're all passionate about wanting to help and serve women. And for me personally, really one of the hardest things is that I receive emails on a regular basis from, from women who do exist in the shadows. Not just other abortion survivors like me, but women who had abortions, regret them, and are living in pain. I have to respond to the emails of women who say, Melissa, can you help me obtain my medical records from my abortion? Can you help me find out if my child is living still today? That's an interesting place for someone like me to be in, but that is what I see in my experiences. Yeah. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your working through that with, with other individuals. Uh, Ms. Busy Phillips, because you're sitting beside Dr. Phillips, but um, would you agree that somebody who has survived an abortion like Melissa Oden has a right once she's born to life, to control over her body where someone else doesn't take her life? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank her for sharing her story. Um, I, you know, it is not, I, although I played a doctor on television, sir, I am actually not a physician. Right. Um, uh, no, but you've was, given very compelling testimony, and I appreciate you've obviously given these issues a lot of thought. That's why correct, I was asking sir. you. Yeah, I think that it's something that's very important. I don't believe that um, a politician's place is to decide what's best for a woman, and you know, it's a choice between a woman and her doctor. So you, I um, I can't. What speak. about a baby and the doctor? That's my question. Yes, sir. Well, I um, again. I can't speak to her experience because I, I was not there, and so okay. I do not well, know. I just wondered how far uh, you're feeling about that went, because uh, once she's born, <clears throat> would you agree that she is a person in being? Yeah, I see. I'm not speaking about birth, sir. Okay. I'm speaking well, there, about abortion. Well, I appreciate that, but the concern here is we've got 21 states um, that allow the termination, uh, and we've heard the governor here in or yes, Mr. across the river in Virginia. But thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I appreciate. No, I just wanted to say, Mr. Gummer, I, I appreciate that um, what you're trying to get at, um, and I. Well, and I, I wasn't do trying know, to get at anything. No, no, no. I, you've answered my question. You you weren't sure. Um, so my time, I only have a minute and a half. Um, I'd like to ask 
Uh, Ms. Bennett, you've obviously done a great deal of study. Have you run into others that you have personally talked to that were in situations like Ms. Oden? I have other friends who have survived an abortion. My friend Claire Cowell, she survived an abortion. Unfortunately, the reason that she survived was because the abortion took the life of her twin brother and the doctor, the abortion doctor, didn't know that there was twins, and so he thought that he had done a successful abortion. And then later on, her mother realized that she was still pregnant, and Claire was inside of her because there was twins. And she was adopted, but when she was born, she had to be put in a, uh, she was in a body cast, and her hip was dislocated, and, and she suffered greatly because of that. And there's other abortion survivors. Josiah Presley is another one, and he's missing part of his arm because of the abortion procedure. And like Melissa said, there's others that are in the shadows. It takes a lot of courage to come out and to share a story like that. And so there's many more that we, we're not privileged to know their stories. Thank you. And I'm being very serious. I appreciate all of you being here because I know what it is to come and testify. And I wish there were a better way to make laws than so-called politicians to come together and uh, <laughs> enforce their will through the laws, but unfortunately it happens uh, every day. I wish it happened a whole lot less, but I appreciate y'all being here and your obvious concern about the issue. I yield back. Thank you, sir. I recognize the, the chair. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous uh, consent that this statement from the National Partnership for Women and Families be placed in the record. Without objection. Thank you. So done. I now recognize Professor Raskin. Five Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, it's hard for me to believe that this is a congressional hearing in 2019. It, it feels like a, uh, a scene out of The Handmaid's Tale, uh, what we're witnessing across the country and what we're hearing about today. Um, so, Dr. Robinson, you practice in Alabama, is that right? And Alabama may soon have a law, tell me if I'm correct, which would compel a 15-year-old girl who's been raped by her stepfather to bring, uh, to bring the pregnancy to term. And if a doctor honored her wish to have an abortion, that doctor would be facing 99 years in prison. Do I understand this law correctly? That is correct. And like I said in my testimony, there is no other area of medicine where physicians are being threatened um, with criminalization like this. Um, if you are the patient, you would want your physician, you would want to be your physician's number one priority when you're sitting in front of them. And with women, this should be the same. We shouldn't have physicians put in a place where they're having to contemplate criminal prosecution versus proceeding with doing what's best for their patients. And if you don't mind, I would like to go back and refer to the question that was asked of Mrs. Phillips, because I am a physician. Please. And states already have laws in place to protect neonates. But it is very, very important to understand that the scenario that was described is not the situation that we are seeing in abortion care um, here. I can't imagine any situation where that would happen. And I think it's really, really important that and we And if it does happen, it should be illegal, right? If there are unsanitary conditions, if exactly. the women are not treated properly, that is obviously a violation of every regulation and law, and whoever does that should be dealt with accordingly. Exactly. And it's important to keep in mind that the majority of abortions take place early in the first trimester. We're not seeing women Let me ask having you about abortions that. in the third trimester. Can I ask you about that? I've got a million questions for okay. you, Dr. Robinson. Your story just seems extraordinary to me. Um, we've heard from our friends across the aisle, and I appreciate the intellectual honesty today, but I want America to hear this. We have heard now uh, that when a sperm unites with an egg, that is a human life. And the logic of that is the Alabama law, which is if it was the product of a rape, it was the product of incest, if the woman is in or girl is in no condition to start a family, to be a mother, still, that girl would be forced to go ahead and to have a baby, even if it's weak 
three, week four, because the moment, as I understand my colleagues, and the gentleman from Louisiana, I think, was very clear about it, when the egg and the sperm unite, that's a life, and that's when it kicks in. Now, let me ask you about that. Um, you bring a lot of babies into existence, right? You are in OBGYN, and so you're... Um, what do you think about this claim that it should be a criminal act for someone to terminate a pregnancy at one month, which was clearly protected under Roe versus Wade. It was clearly protected under Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which drew the line at viability outside the womb of the mother. Well, I don't support any legislation that pushes abortion care out of the reach of women. I know as a physician that it is really important that all women have access to the care they need, regardless of the point they are in their pregnancy. And I know that any legislation that takes this out of the hands of physicians and patients puts those women at risk. Thank you. Ms. Dolphin, let me come to you. So, um, the, the, our, it's very clear that all of this litigation is meant to go up to the Supreme Court, which they have successfully gerrymandered now because of the stonewalling of my constituent, Merrick Garland, who didn't get a Supreme Court confirmation hearing for a year. But they think now they've got the perfect straight flush. They're going to be able to destroy Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And our colleagues across the aisle are cheering them along. Okay. Now, Let's say this were to happen. I want to go back to this very interesting question about sterilization and compulsory abortion. If the choice is not a woman's to decide what happens with her pregnancy pre-fetal pre viability, which is the Casey framework, and all, so let's say Roe versus Wade over, is overturned, Casey is overturned, could the 30 governments, which had compulsory sterilization laws just in the last century, not even a century ago, could they go back to having a compulsory sterilization law? Could, could uh, authoritarian right-wing governments throughout the country go to compulsory abortion laws for populations that they don't like because it would not be a woman's right to choose? At that point, it would just be up to the government to decide what happens in the, the woman's womb? This is a real concern if the, if the court were to say that people do not have the right to control what happens with their own body. It, uh, even that's a very frightening prospect and it could lead to the frightening prospects that you uh, describe. But what we also know is that- And that's not a crazy hypothetical, right? A majority of the states in the country had compulsory sterilization laws for populations that were deemed unfit by essentially authoritarian governments. And most of them, uh, or a lot of them existing in the very states which today are trying to ban the woman's right to choose. It's certainly true that this country has a disgraceful history of um, those types of laws. Uh, we see those kinds of, uh, and we see that kind of thing happening today, even today with the administration's policy of separating uh, immigrant uh, children from their families. Um, so that's a real part of our history. I, I yield back, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Klein, you're recognized for five minutes, our distinguished young first-year star. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, the witnesses for being here today. I especially want to thank uh, Ms. Bennett and Ms. Oden for, for being here today as well. Uh, I, it's, it's an amazing story for both of you, uh, and, and it's remarkable that you are able to be here today. Um, you know, Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia um, is ground zero right now in the fight over late-term abortions. And while I appreciate the uh, discussions of the chairman uh, who, about uh, states endeavoring to pass pro-life measures like Mississippi, uh, we only need to look at his own state of New York to see just how extreme these laws have gotten. Uh, the law recently signed into the, the bill recently signed into law by, by Governor Cuomo allows abortion on demand through the moment of birth. Uh, it allows non-doctors to perform abortions, could result in forcing, forcing health professionals to participate in abortions even if they object, removes protections for children born alive during abortion attempts, but leaves them at the mercy of the abortionist who just minutes earlier was trying to kill them, completely removes unborn children from the criminal code, meaning even those who are victims of violent crimes against pregnant women are unprotected. In Virginia, my own state, uh, we recently saw similar legislation introduced and uh, the testimony by the patron 
Uh, she summarized that the bill would have allowed abortionists to self-certify the necessity of late-term procedures, eliminate informed consent requirements, repeal health and safety standards for abortion facilities, permit late-term abortions to be performed in outpatient facilities, remove ultrasound requirements, and eliminate Virginia's 24-hour waiting period. In her testimony at the hearing, uh, when she was given the uh, hypothetical of a woman who was about to give birth that has physical signs she's in labor, uh, would that be a time when she could request an abortion uh, if she were in the middle of labor and dilated? Uh, the delegate said, Mr. Chairman, that would be a decision that the doctor, the physician, and the woman would make at that point and that her bill would allow that, yes. Uh, when she claimed that her bill would have done nothing to change Virginia's late-term abortion law, uh, PolitiFact rated that false. Uh, we then heard from our own governor, who, when discussing that bill, said on the radio, quote, if a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. That is an extreme position. The 14th Amendment says, nor, any, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property to begin. And then it goes on, there's no uh, the, the word abortion isn't found in the 14th Amendment, the word life is. And when we talk about protecting life, I appreciate the difficult and challenging decisions that were made by the women on the panel, and, and their testimony is uh, stirring. Two of the women were not talking about the important decisions affecting their lives, they were talking about their lives, the ability to even be here today. And that is significantly different. So I'll ask Ms. Oden, you've made it your life's work to discuss your story. Could you describe more about your efforts and the impact that your life, which could have been cut short, has had on others? Thank you so much for all of your words and for acknowledging, I think, what the white elephant in this room is, right? All of these people here today had a privilege that I was not given, and that is simply the right to be born and not be born accidentally. And as you can hear in my voice, I get choked up about it. We see this as a political issue, but I have to live with this every single day. And like so many of you on this panel, yes, I'm a mother. My daughters are 11 and almost five. My oldest daughter was born at the very same hospital where my life was supposed to end. And trust me, I didn't want to do that. I didn't think I could do that. But my children will grow up knowing that they're only alive because an abortion failed to end their mother's life. That is why I do the work that I do because I don't get to run away from this. I don't get to pretend like maybe this happens to someone else, that this maybe is an issue that doesn't affect me. And I truly believe that if each and every one of you in this room ever lived in my shoes, you would feel very differently about this issue. You're welcome, sir. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cohen, for holding this important hearing, you know, especially in light of recent attempts to limit critical reproductive rights for women across America. You know, as we are hearing, there are a million reasons why someone might choose to continue or end a pregnancy, reasons including the life or health of the mother, uh, whether a fetus has a fatal illness or a severe uh, an anomaly. Uh, the circumstances of conception, including rape or incest, the mother's socioeconomic status, religious, philosophical beliefs. Um, we've also heard very eloquently from some of our witnesses of difficult situations that have informed their decisions, including apparently criminal acts in some cases. As someone who has used Planned Parenthood for family planning 
uh, services to plan my own family and has also held the hand of a young woman who chose to terminate her pregnancy after she was raped by a sexual predator 20 years her senior. I support the right of all women to make those choices based upon their own unique circumstances. I believe we must protect women's right to have access to a full range of reproductive health care options and the ability to make those decisions in consultation with their medical providers based upon their own circumstances and their own religious beliefs, not someone else's religious beliefs. I also want to thank the young people who are here today, particularly the young women who are taking a stand to protect those rights. Now, I am particularly concerned based upon experience I've had with my clients in the legal services world about the fact that a, a person's zip code or their socioeconomic status sometimes determines their ability to access basic medical care. Um, and with that, um, Ms. Dalvin, you've, you've talked about the fact that we shouldn't have a theoretical right to abortions, but that uh, women with socioeconomic privilege often have more access to reproductive and abortion health care than, than others. And women of color or of limited means or in rural America are far more likely to have only a theoretical right to abortion. Can you speak to that topic and, and how bills like the Women's Health Protection Act, um, of which I'm a proud co-sponsor, might address that issue of justice with respect to reproductive health care? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, because of restrictions already in place, uh, it is difficult, if not impossible, for many people, particularly low-income people, people of color, immigrants, uh, folks who live in rural America, for, to get the care they need. And there are, uh, I'll just give you an example of three types of laws that, that uh, contribute to that. One are laws that prevent insurance coverage from covering abortion care, like the Hyde Amendment, um, and other state la similar laws. Um, those laws uh, make it impossible for many people to pay for the care they need. There was a recent study by the Fed that showed that 40% of Americans would have real difficulty paying for an unexpected uh, $400 expense. So you can imagine um, the difficulty of coming up with any uh, for an abortion. The second type of laws are clinic shutdown laws that have left um, 11 million American women more than an hour's drive from uh, a clinic. And the third are laws that require people to make multiple unnecessary trips to the clinic before they can get the abortion care they need. So just imagine that you are a person who has a minimum wage shift job that doesn't allow you any flexibility to take time off of work, doesn't allow you any paid time off, and you're trying to mount these um, really insurmountable barriers of trying to um, get to the clinic not once, not twice, not around the corner, but more than 100 miles away, perhaps without a car, um, often without uh, public transportation systems. Um, it's really near impossible for people to get the care they need. We heard Dr. Robinson talk about her patients who have to sleep in the car overnight um, because they lack the means to stay in a hotel and are forced to go to these unnecessary trips. Um, so I, I really thank you for the question because it shows that even if the court doesn't overturn Roe, uh, we have tremendous barriers and we need the Women's Health Protection Act and the Each Women Act to ensure that every person who needs an abortion can get it no matter where they live and no matter how much money they make. Okay. And Dr. Robinson, one quick question for you. There's been some arguments made today that providing abortion care harms women of color and minority populations. Do you have a response to the suggestion that by, by providing the care that you give, you're harming minority communities? I'm, a, I'm appalled by any insinuation um, that refers to the painful history that we as African Americans have experienced, the oppression that my people have experienced, to use that as a way to restrict abortion access. I know that all women need access to safe abortion care women from all backgrounds. And it is very important that we focus on what's most important and utilizing um, race as a reason or to point out a reason that we should not have this access is unacceptable. Thank you, I yield back. Ms. Garcia from Houston, Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for 
given us the opportunity to talk about a very important uh, topic and, uh, and perhaps prepare for what may be coming um, later in the Supreme Court. Uh, before I begin my question, I wanted to introduce someone in the audience, Alicia Hunt, who is here with us today, uh, shadowing me. Um, you know, Congresswoman Abbas has a shadow program uh, from her uh, caucus on foster youth, and um, we're pl really pleased to have her today, and I think she's getting her a really good on-the-ground uh, on uh, education. She's a social work student in Texas, and I'd like to welcome her today. Uh, secondly, you know, I'm one of 10 children. I'm Catholic, but I am pro-choice. I know what my church says, but I also know that I cannot impose those religious beliefs on my church, on, on others. So I've been an advocate for a woman's right to choose, which simply does mean that it is up to the woman, her physician, and her network, her husband, her, her family, uh, to make this decision, and that it's not something that a politician uh, put, should put, set their will on someone else. Uh, so for me, it's, it's troubling to hear some of the remarks that have been made by, by some of my colleagues and some of the witnesses, uh, particularly when it comes to serving vulnerable populations, underserved populations, and women of color. Because I have seen firsthand uh, what it does uh, in terms of negative impact when women of color and underserved communities don't have the proper health care that they need. And I was really struck by the a testimony of um, Dr. Phillips uh, when, when you said that um, the mortality rate is increasing because we're putting uh, more focus on the fetal well-being rather than on the mother's well-being. Could you just, I mean, what does that really mean? I mean, how does it impact Latinas like myself? How does it impact African American women, Native American women, uh, uh, if the focus is shifting? Thank you for this question. Um, there are many avenues by which we're seeing this play out uh, in the medical field. Um, one is, is perhaps altruistic in a sense. Um, physicians are uh, working to promote uh, fetal well-being by um, postponing deliveries under circumstances where we realize that continuing the pregnancy for even a day or a week may increase that patients' risk of acute uh, issues, including mortality, and now long-term health care risks. Um, they may uh, be doing this because they are hoping for the best and thinking that they can postpone delivery um, until the fetus is a little bit farther along. Um, but there are many examples of communities where the doctors themselves have different approaches um, and are postponing care for the patient who is in front of them, the person who is in front of them, with the idea that they are instead promoting um, fetal well-being. And one way to understand this is to understand the ethical principles that all physicians are guided by. Uh, the individual in front of us is our patient, but she is also the person. That is the definition. The fetus is a patient but not, does not have the personal rights that supersede the woman's. Um, and this plays out all the time in right. care. And in fact, we have one of the highest mortality rates in this country. Right. Higher right. than some other third world countries. Correct. And a lot of uh, research into this and questioning into this may very well be that um, either the healthcare systems um, or the doctors themselves uh, or opinions of physicians themselves may be pushing uh, the limits Thank of you. maternal health and care. Thank you. I need to get one more in, and this one is for uh, Dr. Ms. Devlin. Um, you also have had a case that involved the Trump's administration, in my mind, blatant uh, abuse of constitutional uh, law by trying to block abortion access to immigrant women. What is the status of that case, and, and, and where, where, where might we be going uh, in the future? Thank you for your question. This was a case, um, we call it the Jane Doe case. Jane Doe was a young woman who came 
um, to this country uh, without her parents seeking a better life for herself. She was um, in, uh, put into a government-run shelter uh, and found out she was pregnant and requested an abortion, uh, and the Trump administration did everything they could to block her, um, took every single step they could. They sent her to um, an anti-abortion counseling center. They told her abusive parents, um, and then they simply blocked the doors. Uh, so we went to court on her behalf. She was resolute in her decision, and after four weeks of unconstitutional delay, uh, um, uh, Ms. Doe was able to finally get her abortion. Um, that didn't stop the Trump administration. We had to go to court on behalf of young woman after young woman after young woman until we finally got uh, the court to say that uh, we could, uh, that, the, that, this, that the administration um, couldn't enforce this policy against any pregnant person. That Trump administration did not stop. They have appealed that decision, and we are waiting for um, a decision from, uh, from the Court of Appeals. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. And like Ms. Garcia, and like Archie Bell and the Durrells from Houston, Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, how important this hearing is to all of the witnesses, uh, whether I agree with your positions or not, this is a crucial um, human rights question. This is a question of dignity and respect. Uh, I take great issue uh, to the fact that anyone who believes in choice, uh, which is far different from uh, flag waivers for abortion, which the anti-abortion people try to portray us, and we are not. And I refuse to accept that definition uh, because uh, we are a multi conglomerate of individuals of faith and other perspectives. Uh, we are women and we are men, and we're Americans. And my heart broke with a series of outrageous, despotic legislative acts from pompous, self-righteous men who had the audacity, and, and, and it might have been uh, men and women who had the audacity to take away the liberty of anyone. Let me say that um, I believe that in the course of uh, uh, Supreme Court cases and others, the dignity of the uh, unborn uh, is respected. I've been through a lot, partial birth abortion and others, uh, which is not a free for all. It is a medical decision being made by a doctor, the faith of the individual and family. Let me quickly ask these questions so my time does not run out. Um, but I wanna be very clear that I take great issue uh, with definitions that are not me. What is a definition of myself is the fact that I lived through the era of coat hangers, uh, broken-hearted lives and death, bleeding to death, backroom operating tables or back alleys, or young people being in your church and all of a sudden you didn't know where they were. God forbid they had died or they were sent somewhere to have that baby. Is that the life that we want for a free and equal country? Let me, Ms. Murray, I have great respect for your family, the Hill family, and of course, uh, Professor Hill, the late Professor Hill himself was a great humanitarian, lost his life shortly after returning from uh, South Africa on the question of climate. Uh, what a visionary. Thank you for being here, um, and thank you for your work. I want you to ask, answer that question of this whole 14th Amendment and the dastardly series of uh, legislative initiatives, in, in particular in Alabama, which is absolutely appalling. If you would hold your point, I just want to get all my questions out and be fair to the chairman uh, to make sure that I have all of them. Let me just say to the ACLU, that case was in our district. Uh, we are honored uh, by the fact that you never stopped on uh, that young lady. I may be able to ask you a question, but I'm, I'm going to just thank you for your work. Dr. Robinson, you lived it. You're from Huntsville. I happen to have been on the board of Oakwood College. You're from Huntsville. Um, I, I couldn't imagine the, the picture of those who voted for it, but uh, from the health perspective, how devastating is it to women's health? How many lives are we going to lose uh, if we uh, uh, continue in this uh, ridiculous uh, pathway? Um, and let me um, go to Ms. Uh, Delvin, who uh, as well, uh, is it true that states placing such restrictions on reproductive care under the guise of ensuring the health of these constituents is in fact uh, deficient of evidence, and you state Alabama uh, does not have a hospital, two-thirds of the counties do not have a hospital that offers obstetrical care as the highest and has the highest infant mortality rate. So for those who, uh, who love life, how devastating it is 
to not have uh, this in Alabama. And then look what they do. How outrageous. So three people I've given a question. Professor Murray, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Representative Lee. Thank you for remembering my father-in-law, Dr. Hill, who is indeed a great man, a greater Houstonian. Let me first start with your point about the 14th Amendment. You are absolutely right that the recent laws enacted in Alabama and Georgia flagrantly flout the precedents of this court. They are patently unconstitutional. We only need the Supreme Court to follow extant precedent to discover that. I also wanted to point out that Representative Klein noted that the right to abortion is not included in the Constitution. I will only note that there are other rights that are not included explicitly in the Constitution, like the right to marry, the right to raise children in the manner of your children and of your choosing, the right to travel, and more recently, the concept of executive privilege that we've heard quite a bit about. None of these are explicitly enumerated in the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I think that's the Dr. Robinson. You heard my question to you? Yeah. Oh, oh boy. Could you repeat it, please? <laughs> um, well, um, I asked you um, about the problem um, you having experienced it, but the problem of the, of the uh, particular um, law in Alabama as it impacts on having children or not. Yes. Um, I am experiencing that. I am an obstetrician gynecologist, and I'm already seeing the impacts of people having opposition to abortion care. And like we talked about earlier, focusing more on the fetus and not the mother. As an obstetrician, I have two scenarios that I can explain to you very quickly just so you understand how this impacts patients. Um, one young lady with severe preeclampsia, which if she was not delivered, she continues to get worse and it could cause her to die or either severely harm her health as over the long term. I had difficulty getting the approvals I needed to deliver that young lady in the hospital. And also with a, young, a mother who was pregnant with twins, uh, she delivered very early. She was only 20 weeks. And after one fetus passed, she was bleeding very briskly in the room. Um, however, we did not want to do a cesarean section because that would be an unnecessary procedure for that mother. Um, I asked a nurse to go ahead and start her Pitocin just to make her start to contract so that the other fetus could pass to decrease her hemorrhaging. And even in that case, um, I after I left the room and I came back and asked, had um, the orders that I had given, had they been implemented, I was told that they had not because one fetus, the fetus that was still remaining inside had, a, had cardiac activity or still had a heartbeat. Either way it go, this mother, she was bleeding. Um, she was very preterm and that fetus was gonna be expelled. The water had already broken. And I appreciate the scenarios or the situations that these young ladies uh, shared, but I would like you to know that those are criminal acts and we already have laws against that. So that's not what abortion providers are doing here. Generally, when there is a pregnancy that we um, induce in the, second, in the third trimester, it's for fetal indications. And in that case, those fetus, those those fetuses are not gonna live outside of the womb. They have medical diagnosis that will prevent that. And when you propose a scenario when you have a fetus born live in a clinic, um, you ask, would we uh, render any care? Like I said, we have laws that already protect neonates, but this is not happening in abortion clinics in Alabama. But I would tell you, if it ever did happen, I would say we should transfer those those uh, babies, but that does not happen. And for those that are born because of fetal anomalies, they can't live outside of the womb. So I would be against um, implementing any heroic measures um, in transferring to the hospital. It would be a waste of resources. Thank you. May I get Ms. Dalvin to thank you so very much? I'm thank, sorry. Thank you. We're, we are out of time. Uh, the, well, could she just answer the maternal mortality? That she, she was my third person. Mr. Chairman, if we allow that, could I have one additional amendment and we'd all be fair? Well, that's why we're not going to allow it. <laughs> Again, give it to me in writing, Ms. Dalvin. Thank you so very much. <laughs> thank you very much. We've had an excellent hearing. I would want to have one more question, and that's Ms. Ms. Gray. You've been an excellent witness. You're the youngest of the panel, and oftentimes the youngest gets overlooked. Uh, a long time ago, I was the youngest, and I'd just like to ask you if you have any things you'd like to express to us about your experience, either in this particular area or just about being here in Congress and what you thought of this panel and what you think we should do and should do better. Thank you for asking me. Um, I'm very happy to be here and see all sides of this debate. Um, the thing that I want us to leave with is that the barriers I personally faced and many people face in accessing abortion, um, it's really just another step to criminalizing um, poor people. 
And in doing that, we are making it harder for people to have families. We're making it harder for people to decide that they can't afford to have families. We're making it harder for people like my father to be able to get homes and people like my mother to be able to be rehabbed and have normal, successful lives. Um, another thing that I would like for us to leave with is that whether we all know it, we know someone who has had an abortion. We know someone who has been impacted by these laws. And it's unfair for us to pass our judgment, especially when we are passing judgment on people who want and need our support. Um, I want to thank you for having me here, and I want everyone to know that everyone loves someone who has had an abortion. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to thank you and everybody else on our panel for being here. We've had a great, great panel. Uh, thank you all. Without objection, all members have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness or in additional materials for the record. With that, the hearing is adjourned. Wow. That was much quicker than what I expected. Yeah, that wasn't as long. Oh, okay.